In 1973, Britain joined the common market. The Tory government's official white paper on our entry into the common market promised us that there would be no erosion of essential national sovereignty. And Edward Heath, the Prime Minister at the time, later added, there are some in this country who fear that in going into Europe, we shall in some way sacrifice independence. These fears, I need hardly say, are unjustified. These fears were entirely justified and Heath knew it. Here's the proof. Well before these statements were made, Britain's Lord Chancellor, the head of our judiciary, sent this letter to Heath warning him that European law would replace British law and that we would lose our sovereign power to make treaties. He wrote, to confer a sovereign state's treaty-making powers on an international organisation is the first step to a fully federal state. In other words, to a superstate into which all the nations of Europe would be merged. As the Lord Chancellor went on to say, the surrenders of sovereignty are serious ones and ought to be brought out into the open now. But Heath and his close colleagues chose not to bring them out into the open. They deliberately chose to mislead the British public. So when we were granted a referendum in 1975 on whether to stay in the common market or get out, it was hardly surprising that we voted to stay in. We had been deceived into believing that the common market was simply an association of sovereign nations that wanted to trade with each other. Just as the Lord Chancellor had foreseen when we first applied to join the EC, we were on the road to a federal European superstate, with Britain being little more than a province governed by unelected bureaucrats in Brussels. Over the years, our politicians have gradually, surreptitiously surrendered our sovereign rights to Brussels, the right of our own fishermen to fish our own waters, the right to manage our own farming industry, and the most fundamental sovereign right of all, the right to make our own laws. The European Court of Justice has ruled that every national court must apply community law in its entirety and set aside any provision of national law which may conflict with it. In other words, laws made in Europe are now the laws of this land. And how they love making them, in 1994 alone, the European Commission imposed over 6,700 diktats on member states, an average of 129 new acts of legislation a week. And it gets worse. When John Major signed up for phases one and two of Economic and Monetary Union, EMU, he handed over another of our essential sovereign rights, the right to run our economy for the benefit of Britain. According to Article 102A, Britain must now conduct its economic policies with a view to contributing to the achievement of the objectives of the community. How then did Major's Chancellor, Kenneth Clark, have the gall to send this letter to all MPs in November last year, assuring them that as long as we do not join Phase 3 of EMU, we retain complete control of domestic economic policy. He knows full well that we gave away this control when we signed up for phases one and two. These are the fundamental rights that define a sovereign nation and distinguish it from a province of a nation or empire. Our politicians have already deviously given away the first two of these rights. Now the European institutions are working on taking away our last remaining rights as a sovereign nation. The right to determine our foreign policy, to organise our national security and to control our own frontiers. Yet again, the people are not being consulted. The Eurocrats' vision of Europe is taking shape. A Europe of up to 25 nations under one parliament, one government, one court of justice, one currency, one flag, even one anthem. And to spread the word, they have a propaganda budget of over £200 million a year, some of which they'll be using in Britain in the run-up to the general election. 
How can this be a proper use of community funds? And why is the German Chancellor Helmut Kohl such a big fan of full economic and political union? Because Germany will be the dominant economic power in Europe and control of Britain's gold bullion and much of its currency reserves will be transferred to the central bank in Frankfurt. In 1996, Chancellor Kohl assured his people that the future of Europe will belong to the Germans when we build the House of Europe. In the next two years, we will make the process of integration irreversible. This is a big battle, but it is worth fighting for. When he heard this, Lord Tony Pandy, the Welsh miner's son, former Labour MP, Secretary of State for Wales and highly respected Speaker of the House of Commons, sent out this warning. Once integrated, dear friends, there will be no getting out. Integration would be the unforgivable crime of yielding up the liberties and rights for which so many of our compatriots nobly fought and died. Major and Blair have used every trick to confuse the issues and stifle the debate, both in the country at large and within their own deeply divided parties. And the deceit continues. The politicians have deliberately arranged for the next European summit, when the important decisions will be made, to take place after the general election. This cynical move allows them to continue to deceive us with empty promises until it's too late. By then, the people of Britain will be powerless to prevent the politicians from going back on their promises. It could be five years until the next general election, Remember Chancellor Cole's chilling words, within two years we will make the process of integration irreversible. Do our politicians have any right to hand over our sovereign powers to Brussels? No. As the great British constitutionalist John Locke made clear, these powers simply aren't theirs to give away. Parliament's powers are on loan from the people. At the end of its term in office, the government must return these powers to the people who then elect a new parliament to which these powers are entrusted for the next five years. The referendum party was formed to fight for the right of the British people to decide whether they want to be governed by Westminster or Brussels. This can only be done after a proper public debate followed by a full referendum. In our short time as a party, we've driven Britain's relationship with Europe to the top of the political agenda, where it should be, because the very future of Britain is at stake. And we've forced the politicians to break their conspiracy of silence and respond. How have Major and Blair responded? By putting up a smokescreen. They're both now offering us a referendum on the single currency. But it's a phony referendum because it deals only with the single currency. It ignores all the powers our politicians have already given to Brussels and those they're about to give away. So even if we vote no in Majors or Blair's phony referendum, it won't stop our laws being overturned by the European Court. It won't stop the wanton destruction of our fishing industry. It won't stop Britain being forced to run her economy for the benefit of Europe and set an exchange rate for the pound that suits Europe. It won't stop the tide of new regulations that are crippling our small businesses. It won't stop VAT being imposed on books, travel, children's clothes and even houses. It won't stop the very real threat of British taxpayers subsidising pensions for the rest of Europe. It won't stop Brussels telling us how many hours a week we should work. It won't stop plans for Britain to give away controls of our borders, national security and foreign policy. So Majors and Blair's phony referendum is nothing more than a cynical fob-off, designed to fool British voters into imagining they have a say on Europe. As the British people have begun to understand how far they have been deceived, we see the politicians running for cover. 
Take Stephen Dorrell, the Minister for Health, and widely tipped as a future leader of the Tory party, a man who has vigorously argued for Britain's membership of a federal Europe. Here's what he has said. Defeat of the Treaty of Maastricht would be an unwarranted act of self-mutilation. European institutions do not represent a threat to our national identity or our national interests. I believe that our membership of the Union classes as one of the major achievements of Ted Heath's generation. Now, all of a sudden, he says he wants to renegotiate our relationship with Europe. Has he really changed his mind or is he simply telling us what we want to hear? We can't afford to believe what politicians say in the run-up to an election. We must judge them on their own voting records. We don't need their empty promises. What we need is a full referendum on our relationship with Europe, either before or at the coming election. And the result of this referendum must bind whichever party wins power at the election, preventing them from changing their minds after it. This is the referendum we propose. Do you want the United Kingdom to be part of a federal Europe or do you want the United Kingdom to return to an association of sovereign nations that are part of a common trading market? This gives the people the choice between being part of a European superstate with one parliament, one government, one court of justice, one central bank and one currency or returning to what we believe we voted for in the 1975 referendum, membership of a free common market for trade while retaining our sovereignty. If the people vote for the second option, to return to the common market concept and retain sovereignty, it's not too late to make it happen. After the referendum, a bill could be put before Parliament repealing the European Communities Act of 1972 and all subsequent legislation. And then a new European association could be negotiated, one that promotes cooperation with our partners but retains our sovereignty. We must have this referendum before or at the coming election because we cannot trust the politicians to deliver afterwards. Already they have quite deliberately arranged to postpone the really important questions on our relationship with Europe until the Amsterdam summit, which isn't until June. This cynical move allows both Blair and Major to continue deceiving us with empty promises until after the election. The voters of Britain will then be powerless to prevent them going back on these promises and surrendering even more of our nation's sovereign rights. It's this referendum, not the phony single currency question, that most British people want to be asked. In a National Harris opinion poll in December 1996, 70% favoured the common market option for Britain and only 19% the federal Europe option. The referendum party will contest over 550 seats at the election, from Aberavon to Wickham, from Aberdeen to St Ives. But we won't be contesting those seats where the main candidates have proven, by their actions and not just their words, that they are fully committed to voting for a fair referendum. Our candidates are not politicians. They're people from all walks of life and every shade of the political spectrum. What unites them is the belief that the peoples of Europe have the fundamental right to decide who governs them. The politicians they elect to their national parliaments or unelected bureaucrats in Brussels. It's not the gift of any one government to give away our sovereignty for the rest of eternity. They get it for five years, that's all they're gifted it for, and that's as long as it must last. We, of course, have saved for years and years for the pension funds of our people who, when they retire. Europe has not been so sensible. So the biggest threat to us is that we will find ourselves having to fund the unfunded pension funds of our European partners.
the effect of uh, us funding pension fund liabilities throughout Europe will be to drive up British interest rates, or rather European interest rates, as they will be in the future, since our government will have no control over interest rates. This will happen for tens of years, possibly generations. So the net effect of that is going to be devastating to the wealth of the nation as a whole. A lot of farmers are fed up with the system. Uh, they're embarrassed by it, they want it changed, they want to come out of the system, they want a better system that regards people and places and not just production. And you know, going to the referendum party conference was an eye-opener because there were so many farmers there. And they really are fed up, it is time to change. For centuries, the seamen of this country have defended their national shores against all comers. Now we've given everybody free for all and our own national assets. We've fought for centuries to maintain that have supported our coastal communities and have been simply given away and it is totally wrong. In October, over 5,000 people from every walk of life attended the referendum party conference in Brighton to debate the only issue on which we're campaigning, a full referendum for the people. This really is the most important issue facing our country, more important than party politics, because if we allow Britain to be sucked further into economic and political union with Europe, whichever party is in government in Britain will have no real power to govern Britain. Brussels will make all the key decisions. We're not seeking government, we're not politicians. Our elected members of parliament will form an ad hoc coalition with other like-minded MPs and fight to secure a referendum for the people of Britain. As soon as we've had it, we'll disband the party. In the meantime, our MPs will vigorously defend the interests of their constituents. The referendum party is led by Sir James Goldsmith who has been watching Europe drift towards a one government, one bank, one court of law superstate, governed by unelected bureaucrats and knows he can no longer sit on the sidelines. Let me now address a number of questions about the referendum party that people rightly ask themselves. Firstly, the referendum party is a single issue. That's true, a single issue party, it is. But can there be a bigger and more determining issue? The referendum party stands for the issue from which all policies inevitably flow. It is the only issue which counts. And we in the referendum party want the people to decide that issue. Until we've settled the fundamental question of who governs Britain, Westminster or Brussels, the gesticulations of all political parties are no more than that gesticulations. Secondly, some suggest that the vote for the referendum party is a wasted vote. Wrong. It's the only vote which counts. A vote for the referendum party is your chance to decide whether Britain will bring home her right to self-government. A vote for the other parties is a vote for Brussels. <laughs> Thirdly, it is said that it could be disloyal for a member of the other political parties to vote for the referendum party. Wrong again. We are not competing for power with the other parties. We seek no power for ourselves. The issue that we fight for is to allow you, not the politicians, to make the decision that will dominate our future. It is well above party politics. We do not ask people to abandon their traditional parties. Once we've obtained a fair referendum, the referendum party will dissolve. This is written into our constitution. We can all then return to our traditional parties. And if we've so decided, the parties will once again have the legal power to govern this nation. The fourth point concerns the claim that we are Little Englanders. The truth is blindingly obvious. The Little Englanders are those who would transform this ancient nation into a mere province of the European Union.
The referendum party is by no means alone in Europe. All over Europe, more and more people are questioning the sense of a Europe with one government, one court of law, one governing bank and one currency, and questioning the right of the politicians to force them into this union. All over Europe, there's a growing divide between what the people want and what the arrogant political elite have decided is best for them. The Danes are very much in favour of a common market where we can trade together, but the Danes are at the same time very opposed to the ideas of having a United States of Europe. If we were to bring about a referendum in Germany, as is my intention, I am certain a vast majority of Germans would vote against Maastricht. Je pense que si uh, l'intégration se fait, I think that if integration does take place in the sense of a federal superstate, the consequences will be as follows. More unemployment, much more unemployment, much less liberty, much less security, much more German control. In Britain, we need a referendum that will bind the next and subsequent governments to a relationship with Europe that we, the people, believe to be right. Until we get this full referendum, nothing else should be on the agenda. Until the other parties offer the British people a full referendum, voting for them is voting for Brussels. Voting for the referendum party is voting for the right of the British people to decide Britain's future. In the meantime, here's what you can do. Become a supporter of the referendum party. We already have over 100,000 supporters and we'll keep you up to date with events as they happen. And they're happening fast. Better still, come and work with us. Be part of your local candidates team at their headquarters or out in the street and play your own part in letting the people decide. It's just a horribly frightening thing that there's loads and loads of pensions going to be paid for in Europe with someone's money and it could well be ours. Our main aim is uh, to actually get um, a fair debate and an open vote on one of the most important issues that this country will have witnessed this century. I'm angry because here is a government who have taken the right from us to be heard. It's time the British people woke up. I think they are waking up. And what we have now is an opportunity through the referendum party to truly do something about it. The referendum that we need is one on Britain's relationship with Europe. And that covers the whole range of areas, not just economic and monetary union. The single currency is simply one aspect of many issues that will affect the people of this country. We do need a referendum on more than the single currency. British politicians in future will have really be rubber stamping the orders coming from Brussels. And that is not what I understand by democracy. It's just time to make a stand. And the stand can only be made by the people. And the referendum party are offering the people a choice to vote in Europe. When we awake from our apathy, we may realise that it is too late and we are powerless to change anything. We must not let this happen. We must have a referendum. We must let the people decide. Our generation must decide. It is our future. I'm going to stand for the referendum party because my roots are here, I live here, the people here are my people, I feel part of it and I believe we've been betrayed by the Eurocrats, the bureaucrats and our politicians. It's now time for us to have our say, the grassroots are here, I'm part of the grassroots. When we've had our say, then I can get back to the land doing the things I want to. But until then, we have to fight for democracy coming back to the people. The sovereignty of this nation belongs to its people and not to a group of career politicians. It is the people and they alone who must decide after a full debate and a public vote whether Britain should remain an independent nation or whether her future will be better served as a new country, the single European superstate, also known as the Federal Europe. Our purpose is to obtain that right to decide. 
We need a referendum badly. And we need it before any new decisive moves are made by any government in this country concerning Europe. For me, this issue towers over party political considerations. It is a concern whether this nation survives with its cherished liberties or not. Give us a referendum in time and we shall survive. My support for Sir James's initiative is natural, for I am in harmony with the sturdy defence of our British Parliament, advanced by my predecessors in the Speaker's Chair in the House of Commons. For me, to remain silent now would be an act of treason, for such cowardice would betray the noble heritage handed on to me by former speakers in the House of Commons. God bless your efforts as you battle for Britain. I wish you well. To register your support or to find out how you can help, call free phone 0800 074 1997